I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the implications of what Joe spoke to you about, uh, and in particular applying them to uh, the more uh, contemporary situation, and to talk about perhaps uh, measures that we can take to uh, deal with the situation as it is, uh, because I think that's part of the uh, sense. I thought it was a fantastic presentation, the first one. I'd like to hear it again and again and again. I think we need to share these things. Um, because we've got 60 people here, but we're really, we ought to have 600. Uh, it's such an important issue. Um, but I'm going to talk about that uh, and talk about really the last, I guess since the, probably the 1945 thereabouts. I'm not sure the exact date, but I want to talk about the institutional separation of Canada's public education from the Christian faith. And that's not uh, something that began recently. It happened many, many decades ago. Uh, at the academy level, at the university level, uh, most of you will know that Canada's universities, with, with very few exceptions, in fact, I can't even think of one, began as confessional institutions. So the University of Toronto was an Anglican one. Uh, Western was Anglican, McMaster was Baptist, McGill was Presbyterian, Waterloo, Lutheran, uh, Queens was Presbyterian, and so on and so on. Um, well, the, the break from those confessional roots took place mid-20th century at various points. Um, and that was the beginning, really, at least, of the visible departure of the Christian faith from the academy. That's the visible <laughs> Departure. I think it, Joe suggested reasons why uh, the seeds of that destruction were already sown there from the beginning, and I think that's actually true. And actually, that my doctoral thesis does, to some extent, chart the decline all the way back in the middle, uh, the early 19th century, with Romanticism <coughs> and so forth. And the modern university, which in Berlin the university began in theology, was banished from the university altogether. And that began the Bible college movement and so forth. So, but that, that's really the time period. And of course, that's when public education began. So it's a serious problem, and it's been going on for centuries. But we're seeing the effect now so that nobody can deny it. Now nobody really can deny it. It's, it's, it's simply obvious. Uh, to choose one example of the continued dying of the light, uh, in 1990, all overt forms of religiosity, uh, such as prayer and Bible re reading, were removed from the Ontario public school system. Um, and this was ironic. It's an irony that we uh, feel rather poignantly. Um, but it's to promote tolerance and uh, a principled separation of church and state. In order to do that, they want to remove the last vestiges of the Christian faith, which is really, as Joe uh, told us, part of the status quo of public education in Canada. Uh, that would no longer be tolerated. The foundation upon which public education was laid, wouldn't, that would no longer be tolerated. We can't do that. We have to remove it in the name of tolerance. There were objections at the time, 1990, at least so I understand. I was in the fourth year of my undergraduate degree at the time. I wasn't a Christian. Uh, if they were allowed, they didn't register with me. I have no memory of it. Uh, and I did follow the papers at the time, so I, maybe there was more of a protest than I am aware of, but I don't think so. I don't think it was particularly loud. It certainly wasn't very effective. Um, why that happened, I would also have to speculate on. Uh, we were talking about this at the table, and it's something that I've long pondered. Is it because um, we understood ourselves as Canadians to be uh, wanting to be multicultural, and this would express that understanding by not insisting on our way, and we don't want to uh, make people who are new Canadians uncomfortable. Is it for that reason? Is it because of a, a 20th century uh, despair in the church? Um, you know, uh, theologies about uh, the end times that uh, people thought, well, we don't need to stick in the public education. Education is really not what the church is about. The church is about evangelism, saving souls. Is it because of that? I, I don't know. But you can see why it would fit into that uh, idea. Um, maybe it was thought that the, the, the church could itself supply uh, the needs of Christians. So on Sunday, you'll, in your Sunday school classes, you'll get instruction of the faith, and then it'll be, be done at home. Um, 
maybe even there was some that saw very optimistically that their children could be salt and light in the schools. Using the very same passage Joe talked about, uh, you know, the little children witnessing um, to their teachers, standing, uh, as it were, in the place of the evangelist. I don't know what the logic of it is, but I've heard all of these things before. Uh, even now, by those who have their kids in the public school system, this is the excuse that variations on these are still out there. So it must have something to do with that at any rate. But most recently, what we've been talking about today in the Ontario curriculum, uh, these new equity and inclusivity policies have followed on their heels. I think most Christians uh, have had a really not a kingdom perspective, but a two kingdoms perspective. And it's to some extent live and let live. Christians have their views, and uh, those that aren't Christian have their views, and we're going to live and let live. We'll tolerate them on that. What they haven't recognized, which we now know, uh, and nobody is disputing at the moment, suddenly, is that they're not going to live and let live. They have a kingdom theology which will say that you must uh, bow to Caesar on these issues. They have a different view of tolerance than we do. Uh, so what we euphemistically call alternative sexualities have now been normalized. That's the norm. If you don't embrace these, you're abnormal. That means Christians are abnormal. You, you've created a yourself as a new breed of humanity, and there's something subhuman about the Christian. Something contemptible, something that needs to be put behind us, something that needs to be evolved away from. It fits in with the evolutionary uh, theology and psychology that's in the, the public school curriculum. And they are threatening their opponents with prosecution if they use what they call hate speech, which is, according to their definition, just applying a different moral judgment in public than the one they now declared to be the public view. They declare to be the public view. I'm not saying it is the public view, but they say it's public policy, part of Canadian identity even, although it's not just in Canada. We've seen the same thing in the United States. And the word homophobia is now used, uh, not as it was originally in the 1960s. It was first used in the 1960s, by the way, my research. I'm not you know, I haven't done an exhaustive study of this, but first crops up in the 1960s. It describes uh, someone who feared he might be considered a homosexual and so wanted to distance himself from that appearance. I don't want to be perceived to be a homosexual. That's my phobia. Now it means somebody who thinks that homosexuality is a sin. So there's a huge semantic shift in what we understand by somebody who's a homophobe. I always think, I, I don't even understand what you're talking about. I don't fear uh, homosexuality in the sense that you're talking about. It just makes no sense. Well, I'll get to that in a second as well. But alarm bells are ringing as we see the fulfillment of the warning made almost 60 years ago. In fact, I think it is 60 years ago now by uh, Hilda Neatby, uh, who's an academic historian and a member of the first, very first Massey Commission. Uh, she said that in the public system, and I quote, even those areas still termed democratic are losing the freedom which gives meaning to democracy because they are losing that sense of direction which gives meaning to freedom. So freedom has no direction it say, per se. They're losing the gospel in other words. Now she doesn't articulate this very clearly. I think it's because she's a product of the public system and she's adopting the language of the Enlightenment to persuade her audience. We can understand that. We all speak uh, with the, the language of the academy for Christians, and then we speak as Christians over here. We speak with two tongues. In that sense, if you're a professional academic, then you're required to adopt the terminology of the guild and acceptance and all that and understanding and so forth. But at this point, freedom is now being lost in the name of democracy, she says. And for Dr. Neatby, and this is 60 years ago, as for many of her generation, this would have meant the necessary orientation of all true education towards Jesus Christ. She was a Christian. Uh, in whom alone there is freedom. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, says he. 
And uh, one wonders if she were writing today whether Dr. Neatme might, might end up in front of one of these human rights commissions which are uh, growing in their scope and influence. And many people are now openly questioning, or at least beginning to question, how it's come to pass in such a, a short space of time. I, whenever I talk to anyone about this, Joe has told me he hears the same thing. People say, how has it happened so quickly? Like, and it has happened quickly. There's been an acceleration. The pedal has now come down. There's no handbrake anymore. There's no resistance. And it just, every year there is a, a substantial change culturally. Now, how did it happen so quickly that the freedom of religious expression and the adherence to Christian moral character is now being pronounced not just tolerated, it's an anathema in the name of democracy. So if you're a Christian, you're, you're opposed to democracy. You are undermining the public good because that is what is taking place, not just here but south of the border. People, Christians are being demonized as being en enemies of the public good. And this is heavily ironic, and we heard reasons why that is from just uh, what we heard from Joe Boot. Since academic freedom can be traced at least as far back as the Christian liberal arts uh, universities of, of the Middle Ages, and the practice of teaching Christian character, moral character, has been in schools for as long as there's been a church. Um, the irony is particularly sharp and really difficult to understand. Well, let me uh, explain how that shift happened, at least uh, in some measure, as briefly as I possibly can. I'm gonna read just little extracts from this Jubilee, which you've all received one of. It's because of what Joe talked about, cultural Marxism. Um, largely through the work of the cultural Marxists. Now the Marxists, as we know, those of us who are old enough, uh, and the Soviet Union and the threat of worldwide communism basically ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1990, 1989 actually. But cultural Marxism has been uh, there at work. It's the other face of Marxism in Western acad academia since the end of the First World War. And it continued and in fact, it, it flourished at the very time when worldwide political communism by coercive force was being put to death. When Gorbachev you know, pronounced glasnost and freedom and so forth and the Berlin Wall fell. At the same time that that was happening, political correctness kicked in in the university when I was an undergraduate in the 80s. That's when it was being rigorously enforced. That view uh, of uh, political correctness is one of the words that uh, stems directly from cultural Marxism, directly. Uh, the school that prompted that was uh, called the Frankfurt School of uh, Philosophy. It sought to stigmatize Christian culture by defining its expressions, that is the Christian culture's expressions, on sexual morality, its views on the family and on paternal authority as nefarious prejudices uh, in a wide-ranging uh, series of academic studies. Uh, the umbrella, and the term was literally studies in prejudice. And prejudice was meant as a derogatory term here. Uh, the most important contribution was by Theodore Adorno. It was a book called The Authoritarian Personality, written in 1950. Uh, he created what he called an F scale. The F scale connected traditional Christian views on the family and on sexuality with varying degrees of fascism. That's the F. So if you are a Christian, you are already a fascist. The specific expression of that is related to your authoritarian personality, which you then impose upon the family and upon sexuality. So in accordance with this, if you're a Christian, you will be called a fascist, according to Adorno, or just a traditionalist, even if you're not a Christian. If you hold views that would be compatible with Christianity, you will be labeled a fascist. So many of you have never heard of Theodore, or Theodore Adorno, I expect, because he's little red. Uh, but most of you will have heard uh, Christianity connected with fascism, as bizarre as that is. Now you know why. It's, it's seeped into the academy. And it's been adopted as basically uh, 
an unquestionable truth. If you hold these views, you have an authoritarian personality, you are a fascist. So, and the, the link is being drawn, and you can see it being happening in the public media as we speak. We need to eradicate people that hold these views because uh, there's a lurking fascism which is just waiting to come out. And we can't, that's why we have to suppress them in the name of preventing Nazi sort of takeovers of Canada. <coughs> Scary people. The other uh, gentleman I want to mention, his name is uh, Herbert Marcuse. Now Marcuse is again little known uh, amongst Christians, largely because Christians, uh, for good reasons, wanted nothing to do with Marcuse. He was another one of these uh, German figures. In uh, the 1968 uh, protests in Paris and Berlin, they marched under the banner of, of Marx, Mao, and Marcuse. So two well-known figures, and one that most of us have never heard of. But it was part of the sexual revolution, and that's where he comes in here. His chief work was entitled Eros and Civilization, 1965, which is a hybrid of Marx and Freud. And he reiterates the case made uh, back in the 1930s by uh, uh, another German by the name of Wilhelm Reich uh, in his Mass Psychology of Fascism and the sexual revolution, and his point is this, that a new paradise where there was only play and no work would be impossible to achieve unless society first, and here's the quote, liberated non-procreative eros from its moral repression. Only then could it return to what Freud described as the infantile stage of pure sexuality the child's uh, polymorphous perversity. Freud believed that, uh, that children were perverse in any manner of sexual ways. And then he attached various stages to it. If you've done any psychology in the universities, you'll remember there's an oral stage and an anal stage, and there's all these sexual stages. And children are open to all of these things. Now, these studies uh, remain there in, uh, in psychology departments, and they are certainly there in uh, the attempt to um, legitimize pedophilia now. They're right there. They're also there in the push for the public education system to begin earlier and earlier. We want to push them but while their, their pure sexuality is untainted by fascism. That's the motivation. That's why one of the reasons we need to get them early. And there's antagonistic rhetoric here, there may, uh, which suggests that their opponents are the aggressors, and you'll remember the slogan, make love, not war. So if you, if you oppose this, in other words, you're the antagonist, whereas we are just in favor of, of love and, and liberation, because that's what it's all about. It's all about freedom. So what Marcuse does is he destigmatizes every sexual expression except heterosexual marital relations which he stigmatizes as sexual repression. And he creates a whole new class of victim group, uh, the sexual deviant. And he adds this to a uh, long train of people that uh, the Western world has repressed, blacks, feminists, and he makes what we call in, in politics the new left. So it's the coalition of these that Mark the Democratic Party in the 60s and the 70s and onwards. And Canadian politics, exactly the same. You will see that uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau was, was uh, marked by the same animus. <coughs> so in his abortion, uh, removing the uh, sanction against abortion in Canada, he also legalized homosexuality. Not coincidental. Marked by the exact same philosophy. He is a cultural Marxist. His son even more so. Just further down the road. Uh, Justin Trudeau would have no room in his party for his father. That just shows how far the march of the left has gone now in politics. Now that's just the, the uh, Liberal Party. You will find the exact same uh, sentiments in the Conservative Party as well. They're just a little bit further behind. <coughs> and they don't want to get too far behind lest they be labeled fascists. Labeling has strong uh, power. Well, how is this so effective, though? We can see how it happens in the, uh, we can see it effectively now, but on the other hand, why do Christians buy into this stuff? How is that possible? That's, to some extent, my question. How is it possible that Christians should buy this? 
because it's just nonsense. And it's, it's manifest nonsense. It's, it's manipulating language, and you can actually see it. Well, <laughs> how is it that uh, these absurd caricatures of Christians being presented in the media now, uh, where um, young adults portray Christians as victimizing them and require government protection for their religious freedoms, uh, arguing that their true goal is to ban gay men from sitting at the local lunch counter or from buying flowers or something like that. As if Christians didn't, you know, really were not willing to even sit beside you in the plane. Uh, you don't want to touch a gay person. We hate gay people. How did that happen? Because it's happening south of the border as we speak. It's, it's really uh, blown up in quite an extraordinary way. How is that possible for that to take hold and not just from above, but from below, because it's the young people that are pushing this, as everyone recognizes. Well, the answer is uh, social studies. That's how. Social studies. Uh, those who were given social studies courses in their schools, which we all were, many of us under the guise of history, actually, we were taught social studies instead of history. There is a significant difference there, by the way. I'm not going to get into that difference. But social studies is taught as history now. And in general, social studies learns about uh, movements of emancipation. It creates straw men of history. So it, first of all, there's the idea of the authoritarian male, which kept women down. And then there's the women's rights movement, in which that was thrown off. And then there's the civil rights movement, in, wh in which the blacks uh, threw off the yoke of the whites, the anti-slavery movement. All of which have, here in this case have a grain of truth to them as well. It's not that there's no substance to it. My point here is that they create the a narrative of history being a series of emancipation from unjust oppression. And the latest installment of that is the LGBT agenda. They've connected their uh, hermeneutic directly to that same uh, agenda of liberation. But it's, it's, it's demonstrably uh, disconnected from it because, again, you can't choose but to be black. And you can't choose but to be a woman, at least not until recently. And now you can. Well, now you can do everything. You can say that I'm standing on my head, not my feet. And I, like, everything's turned upside down. OK, so but aside from that, you can't, you can't really be anything other than what your skin color and your, your sex, sex is. I'm male or I'm female. So how does that fit with, uh, with the LGBT choices? Because there I can also choose not to do them. So it's something I can actually choose not to do. There is choice there in it. Well, I, don't, I think it's partly, first of all, because the education is so terrible now that people don't tolerate logic. Never mind tolerate revelation. They don't tolerate logic, which actually is an effect of not tolerating revelation, because if you're not going to accept God's standards, whose standards are you going to accept but man's? And if it's going to be man's standards, well, what are they rooted in other than social consensus? Well, the social consensus has moved on. But why does it work? Well, it's because these social studies are not studies in history. They're studies in uh, hagiography, basically. These are the saints of our days, right? That's what kids are being presented as. And they want to be praised as the saints of their days. They want to be the freedom fighters that that generation was. They're being encouraged to do this. They're being encouraged to be activists like Martin Luther King was, like the, the, the uh, women's rights uh, activists were. That's what they're being encouraged to do. And the reason why it's attractive is because it involves no work whatsoever. You don't have to work. You just have to protest and demonstrate and rebel. Go out on the streets. You don't have to work at it. There's nothing you have to learn about it. You just have to be actively involved. That's all that's required of you. And you will be praised for it. And you are being praised for it. The media will pick it up and publicize you in doing that. Now, I don't mean to uh, belittle uh, people on this, but you can get some of the stupidest people and least talented you can imagine as the uh, representatives of, of this. I, I don't even need to argue the point because I can see heads shaking in, in agreement because it, it is simply so. No talent really is required. 
<laughs> just a very big mouth. And now gay marriage is that, is that uh, that's the new uh, hill to be taken. It's already happened in Canada, more or less. I could uh, dispute that a bit as well. But it requires no moral consistency, no financial act, uh, uh, sacrifice, no effort. We can sleep with as many people as we want. We can divorce as many people as we want. We can father and abandon as many children as we want. Uh, and we lose no credibility at, uh, whatsoever because moral, uh, moral criteria don't even apply here. It's great. And I can be a hero. So it's not just an intellectual thing. It's, it's a moral thing, and it's also an orientation of the heart, and it appeals to the young people particularly those who are academically challenged, to use the vocabulary. How has this worked out in the curriculum then? Let me look at this very briefly, if I can. I'm gonna use uh, another institution's website on this. So this is, these are excerpts from the 2015 sex ed curriculum which, as Joe said, is more or less the same as the 2010 curriculum. If you want a, a decent analysis of how involved Benjamin Levin has been in the curriculum, there was an article by Ben Warmington, Joe Warmington, in the uh, Sun, March 3rd, somewhere thereabout, uh, where he, he demonstrates, I think quite persuasively, that Levin continued to have his hand in the educational spheres uh, all the way up until the time he got arrested for child pornography, at which point he stopped being, but all the way up till that point. So even past the time uh, where he was part of the transition team, he was still being consulted on major decisions. And he was the architect of the 2010 curriculum. There's no doubt about it. He's the, he's the deputy minister. He's a Canada research chair. Um, and the deputy minister is the, is the professional on that. The minister just, you know, that's the public face of it. He's the one who was responsible for it. There's no doubt about it. That's what deputy ministers do. Everyone knows that. Uh, grade one, genitalia and consent. So you learn about sexual body parts, identifying them and so forth. Uh, both of them have promised that teaching of, quote, enthusiastic sexual consent, that is Kathleen Wynne and her education minister, Liz, Liz Sandals. Uh, this teaching of enthusiastic sexual consent will be weaved throughout the sex ed curriculum, beginning in grade one. It will be progressively more explicit in each grade so that, quote, children can see what consent looks like. It's not just consent in the abstract, it's sexual consent. I can understand that through gestures and so forth, nods of the head facial expressions. This, the government has given no specifics on how that's going to be fleshed out. Those that are, are uh, skeptical of the, of, the, of the skeptics and are defending the government are saying, you're making this all up. Look at the curriculum. There's only one line there. You're jumping to all sorts of wild conclusions. That may be so. I think not. I'll demonstrate why that isn't in, in, in a few minutes. In grade three, this is, is an addition from the 2010. This is gender as a changeable social construct. So sex, you are either male or female. Gender as a category is a social construct. Since the second sex uh, by Simone de Beauvoir, she talks about sex as male and female, gender as the social attributes connected to that sex. So women are expected to wear uh, certain types of clothing, skirts, dresses, whatever. Men are expected to shoot guns or something like that. Those are social constructs. They can change from culture to culture. Um, that's how she uh, sets it up. Nowadays, thanks to literary theory, the two are interchangeable, and people use gender for sex, and sex only for the act of sex now. It's got nothing to do with biological sex anymore. But if you'll notice to your, your birth certificate, at least I think this hasn't changed yet, or your driver's license, it will say sex, male or female. It won't say gender. Yet. But I think that will change. We'll have to get rid of all hints that sex and gender are something different. But it teaches gender identity as if it were a fact. So the way you look as a boy or a girl or the uh, physical attributes of being a boy or a girl can now be contradicted by how you feel about yourself. 
this is so manifestly ridiculous that it's hard to even engage with it, but just let me uh, bring one obvious educate, never mind the moral implications, the uh, psychological effects, although the psychological effects of being uh, changing your sexual identity are terrible. To change your sexual identity, it's something like the suicide rate is approaching 50%. We'll leave all that aside. We'll deal with the simple educational reality, which is you are saying that two things can be the same thing at one and the same time and then one in the same way, which is a logical contradiction. It's a logical fallacy. Well, if that's at the heart of the sex ed curriculum, then education, as Joe said, is no longer even a, a concern of this curriculum because you're introducing a logical fallacy and the implications of that are obvious to every child. And the implications which every child will take away from it is that actually I'm not here to be educated. I'm just here to do what the people who are teaching me want me to do. So now it's out explicit and outright indoctrination and the kids get that right away. What that means is they don't have to study hard and they don't have to work and they can sexually experiment and they will be rewarded for it as the new saints. They will be praised for it. In fact, that's what their teachers are supposed to do is to make them enthusiastic about it. When I hear people uh, speak against this, particularly those who claim to be Christians, I think that they have had a lobotomy I, I hesitate to name names because you can actually come to your own conclusions on this. But if you cannot see the problem with the sex, sex and gender uh, connection here, then you can't think. You simply can't think. That's just my uh, primary objection. I could say worse things. But you cannot think. You're also introduced to homosexuality in grade three. I don't, most of us have no idea of anything like this when we were that age. We didn't think about such things. But it's introduced. Now remember, consent underlies the whole program from the beginning. So that's the initial step. And the key one is to introduce the idea of consent. And then everything that follows along to it, you have to consent to it. And now this, and now this, and now this, and now that. So they're going to normalize homosexual family structures and the homosexual marriage in the minds of eight-year-olds. Doesn't matter what the families think on this. Some will say that you can opt out of this curriculum. I'll address that a little later on. Because in practice, that's not happening. Uh, in grade four, they're introducing the idea of romantic dating. Grade six, masturbation. Grade seven, anal intercourse and oral sex. All of these things we'll talk about practices uh, without considering the consequences, never mind morally, even physically. The physical consequences of, of anal sex and the incidence of sexually transmitted infections are off the charts for anal intercourse. It's not even mentioned in the curriculum. This is a health curriculum. How can it not be even discussed on those terms? Not even discussed. Uh, at this point, I think the government is actually legally liable if something does result from this. So if there's a demonstrated cause and effect, I think the government, and that means we, the taxpayer, are on the hook for this. And ought to be. And then grade eight, you can make a personal plan about your sexual activity. So write your own plan for conquest and uh, sainthood. Write it up. Here's what you want to do. So, some say you can opt out of this curriculum, and it, there are forms there where you can do exactly that. So if you're a Protestant, if you're a Catholic, you can choose to opt out, you click on it, there's a form for it. In practice, people are being refused this already. And incidentally, all of the alarmist statements I'm making here, which are not alarmist, they're just alarming, uh, can be verified because the, this curriculum is already operational in the Toronto District School Board already there. And they promote this here, and I'll just use a few of the posters that'll give you a taste and flavor of what's going on here. Some of you have seen these before. These were taken from the TDSB website before they took them down when they got backlash. I fortunately captured them and they're on my hard drive. You might struggle to find these now, although the posters are probably still in the schools, but this one is Love Has No Gender. And it has no number because there's also threesomes there and so forth. 
This one is uh, safe and positive spaces. We're here, we're queer, we're in your school. We got multi colored fish swimming in opposite directions. You swim whatever direction you want, according to whatever sort of fish you are, and you can change whatever sort of fish you are. This one is that there are no rules for being a boy or a girl. That in the middle here, you probably can't see it, is a little boy with an orange wig sitting on a pumpkin with pink long leather boots, I believe. And there are others there, a little a black boy wearing a tutu, a pink tutu and so forth. It says, when we respect each other for who we are, there isn't anything we can't do. Name calling hurts, shaming hurts, stereotypes hurt. As if they're not stereotyping. Because they're not, they're just doing what's natural, right? Begs the question of what nature is, which they never answer because they can't answer it. Positive spaces. This one I think I'll just pass over. Some of the books. This one's probably worth doing. The gender and sex confusing. Remember, these are posters in the Toronto District School Board. If you think the sex ed curriculum, you're thinking, well, it may not be as bad as it may get. The posters advertising it and the thought police that come in to make sure that the teachers go along with this is only an aspect of the curriculum which is not mentioned in the document, but is sure to follow. The term gender shall include actual or perceived sex and shall also include a person's gender identity, self-image, appearance, behavior, or expression, whether or not that gender identity, self-image, appearance, behavior, or expression is different from that traditionally associated with the legal sex assigned to that person at birth. Note it's assigned to them an act of aggression, an authoritarian personality that said that's a boy or that's a girl. It's been assigned to them. It can be reassigned by the person himself in an act of liberation. These are all presented in the sort of uh, books that are now available in your public libraries, like My Princess Boy and others whose authors, some of whom have explicitly and openly stated that their aim is to indoctrinate your children into the LGBTQ lifestyle. So now it's uh, readily apparent to anyone who pays attention what's going on among today's youth and what's coming. Uh, a study entitled Hemorrhaging Faith came out in 2011. Have you heard of this? According to that report, only one in ten young adults in the Roman Catholic and the mainline Protestant churches who attend a church at least weekly as a child still do so today. That's one in ten. If you're an evangelical, it's clear that there are more people leaving than staying. So four in ten young adults who attend a church at least weekly as a child still do so today. All in all, include them all, 70% approximately, of young adults are leaving the church. So it's abundantly clear for those who are keeping their kids in the public school system, and that's largely the case, it's not exclusively the case. It will also be through the Christian schools, who are often using the public school curricula, that their children are not being salt and light, they're being lambs to the slaughter, and there's no atonement in this. Now, their parents have naively assumed that the school is just like it was when they were young, because they went to public school, I went to public school. It ain't so. It ain't so. What we can see is that Western civilization has undergone a top to bottom reversals. Now people see themselves as fundamentally sexual creatures, not people made in the image of God. In the new view of the human person, we are sexual creatures first, which this curriculum teaches. This is a religious indoctrination. It's not just about sex education. We're first and foremost sexual beings, not religious ones. Any Christian ought to oppose this idea. We're made to worship God and enjoy him forever. That's what we're created for. This says that we're made for sex. This teaching has seeped into the churches as well and has been permitted ever since no-fault divorce was accepted. That's when the barricades were overcome in the church. And now we push back on the gay agenda because now the consequences are obvious, but there, how many pastors have been speaking against divorce? And for how long? This will make for some <coughs> squirming in seats. Loyalty to sexual autonomy is demanded of everyone. 
just as much as loyalty to orthodoxy was demanded by the historic church. So we do have a, a, uh, a church in the state. It's the state church, which is the public education system and its curriculum. One of my favorite movies uh, is an adaption of a play by Robert Bolt. It's called A Man for All Seasons. Anyone seen that? It's an, old, it's an oldie. It's a really good one. Um, I think it was made in 1967. I encountered it when I was in grade 13. Uh, it's about Thomas More, the Catholic saint. It centers around his refusal to violate his conscience by agreeing to the dissolution of Henry VIII's marriage. It presents, uh, it's a hagiography really, is what the movie is about. And if you know anything about Thomas More, it really is a hagiography because he's not actually as great. But, but here he's presented just as a saintly man. Leave that aside. I think it's a compelling uh, story. And he lived in the day when to make any assertion against the king and the self-proclaimed head of the Church of England was to be accused of treason immediately. Now, this is a capital offense. Off with your head. He was... Uh, uh, despite the fact that he made no assertion of, uh, against anyone, least of all, or least of all the king, he was still accused of treason. Uh, the famous trial scene at the end of this movie has him being interrogated by a prosecutor, claiming that although he, Thomas More, had never said anything about his views to anyone, everyone in England knew what he thought. Everyone knows what he thought. Of all the people who haven't spoken in England, no one has spoken more loudly than Thomas More with his silence. And Thomas More, the consummate lawyer, says, not so, not so. The silence is qui tacit consentit. The, si the maxim of the law is that silence gives consent. If therefore you wish to construe what, I, what my silence betokens, you must construe that I consented, says More. So if I don't say anything, I agree to it. Let's apply that now. Very different social and cultural situation. We don't live in an age of monarchy where the head of state is also the head of the national church, although I've just talked about the sex ed curriculum and how it's an expression of that. But we still live in a democracy. We still, uh, largely thanks to the Reformation, have a separation of powers, at least uh, in theory. There is a defined role for the state, still, just. There's a defined role and authority for the church, and there's an area of sovereign authority for the family. It's enshrined in our laws. Well, at least since the time of Plato, this has been under assault. Uh, since Plato, philosophers have argued that parents are naturally unfit to educate their children. There's always been a push from the uh, experts, the philosopher kings, to take the role of parents from them. Plato had no children, of course, unsurprisingly. One of his great admirers, Rousseau, the Enlightenment philosopher, whose ideas actually ground modern education theory. He's a romantic. Uh, he was so enamored with the idea that the state should take responsibility in administering social justice and taking care of kids that he absolved himself of all parental responsibility. He had five kids out of wedlock, and he stuck them all in orphanages. He was a true believer in the state, uh, the goodness of the state. He can be as irresponsible as he wants, and that's his way of affirming the state's power. Scandalous character. The liberals love him. In his 1935 BBC radio debate with another educator, a statist, philosopher, Bertrand Russell, some of you have read his History of Western Philosophy, uh, G.K. Chesterton wryly retorted to this claim that the, uh, uh, the state knows best what every reasonable person uh, recognizes, which is that uh, the immoral example of uh, exceptional men like Rousseau proves the rule, which is that parents know best about what the, the welfare of their children is. The parents know the best. There are bad parents. We recognize that. In our day, there are a lot of bad parents. The remedy is not to get rid of parenthood. That's not the remedy. That's a further decline, to absolve parenthood altogether and parental responsibility is to destroy society from its foundations. Well, the status won out for a while, actually. 
It happened during the Second World War. The intervention of the Second World War and the rise of communism settled the matter and the statist side, we had the Hitler Youth. In communist uh, countries, we had uh, men and women being pushed into the workforce, their children being left to be educated by the state. Their brief success led to a pushback by the UN of all agencies. I don't trust the UN for very much. The UN pushed back on this. They came in 1948 with Article 26 of the Declaration of Human Rights. They declared that parents had, and I quote, a prior right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. It's their right first, and it remains their right. If it's the first right, it's not one that can be taken away from them. Now that's the UN speaking collectively against the fascists and the communists. It's a hedge of protection. <coughs> we could call into a, a, another argument here. This is, by the way, from uh, an article I wrote in the National Post in uh, response to Michael Corrin, incidentally. Um, by Cambridge anthropologist J.D. Unwin. He wrote a work in 1934 called Sex and Culture, right around the time when Wilhelm Reich was writing his work on sex. This is a Cambridge anthropologist, world-renowned expert. He studied 80 primitive tribes. He studied six known civilizations over 5,000 years of history. Comprehensive study. He found the success of a civilization was directly linked to the degree of sexual restraint it observed. Quote, any human society is free to choose either to display great energy, civilizational energy, to flourish, or to enjoy sexual freedom. The evidence is that it cannot do both for more than one generation. Sexual freedom comes at the cost of the destruction of an entire civilization. In the name of social justice, society is being uprooted from its foundations. This is not about sex, it's about uh, worshiping a false god. And the inevitable, why do we have abortion being promoted by gay marriage advocates? Why are these two linked? They're both anti-life, that's why. Sex is attached to something very different. So wor worship of their own procreative powers. So the life or death of a civilization, which is at stake in the Christian teaching of natural sexual monogamy, which is a moral conviction and social institution that Unwin observed common to all flourishing cultures, would have been a powerful argument in favor of teaching that the family, mom and dad, are essential to the health of an individual. We just had the sex ed curriculum, but the family, mom and dad, they're essential to your health, physical and mental health, and to creating a more just society. It can only be a just society if it continues to flourish, right? If justice can be, if, if everything's falling apart, then you're putting out fires all over the place. You can't actually build anything. But Chesterton never made this appeal, largely because nobody uh, in his right mind at that time would have debated the sexual education of children. No, at least, uh, acceptable public figure would have debated this. They had the age-old question of which adults would be responsible for the education of children. Who would be fit to do the task of creating a just society? Bertrand Russell said the state. Chesterton said the parents. Neither of them said what our sex ed experts now say which is that the kids do it. The children are responsible for their own education because they raise themselves effectively. They consent to what their identity is going to be, their human identity. To claim your human identity in terms of your sexual identity is to make a claim about your human nature. When God creates Adam, uh, mankind, he creates the male and female. You're either or, but the one is that it's attached uh, inseparably to your human nature inseparably, you're either male or you're female. So the convictions of this curriculum, which I've just briefly traced, are not liberating, they're destructive. The debate is, as ever, between the parental and the state jurisdiction in creating a just society. And you will hear the critics of people like me attacking us for precisely, you know, being simple-minded, alarmist, etc., 
as if it were a matter of, well, they don't want them to talk about penises. Well, guess what? They're going to learn about talking about penises. Nobody is worried about that, per se, actually. I've never heard anyone make that claim. They're worried about the stuff that I picked out, the general thrust of the curriculum. But as I say, at the heart of the Ontario sex ed curriculum is the perverse claim that children raise themselves. Now, this is explicit from the very outset, as we saw. At the age of six, the age of teaching of sexual consent is there. Now, to teach children what consent means, even in the rudimentary terms that Kathleen Wynne has given, which is when she was asked by the CBC about it, well, it's about reading facial expressions and emotions. To assume that is to assume that they have the capacity, the moral capacity, to understand what they're learning. And we know that this is, cannot be because the legal age of consent is 16 or 18 which is, goes with being an adult. You have to be morally responsible if you're going to have a just society, right? By six years of age, the human eye has not even fully developed. The eye that's looking at the facial gestures and reading sexual consent hasn't even fully developed. It's not only that she doesn't understand education, she has, nothing, she has no knowledge about anything, I would say. And Ben Levin is a demonstrable pervert. He's about to be convicted. Either two years or three and a half. That's what they're debating now. He's going to be convicted. By the way, this is the uh, eye development is historically why children started their education in their seventh year, because that's when they can concentrate. You'll note this. Now, the intent of the word consent is related to sexual identity. I get that. But they have given it a legal jurisdiction and am, are imposing it with the rule of law and saying to violate this is a matter of law. Well, the critics of this curriculum are absolutely right, because this is nothing other than an experiment on children. It's an experiment on children, as lab rats. The document does not consider love. It doesn't consider marriage. It doesn't mention either of them in the whole 100, 244 pages of this infamous document, which I urge everyone to oppose as strongly as you possibly can. It speaks of sex in consumerist terms of choice. There's no moral, there's no religious, there's no social consequences. There might be some health consequences, but we don't want to get into the specifics there. It doesn't consider that the demonstrably bad health consequences of homosexuality are, again, off the charts. This does not teach at all. It's not the teaching of a just society. It's a perverted individualism, perverted separates their children from their parents. It separates them from the very idea that one day they're going to be parents and they're going to be responsible. There's no responsibility here. There's freedom without any responsibility. Well, that's not freedom at all. It's exploitation. If there's nothing that limits your responsibility or your freedom, then what is your definition of freedom? It has no definition. Anything goes. Again, this is just logic. It is being imposed on the only people in Ontario whose consent is actually required, which is the parents. My question to you is whether your own conscience will permit you to consent to having this curriculum foisted not just on your own children or your own grandchildren, but on the children that you see all around you, walking in your churches, walking around on the streets. Or are you going to be silent? Because remember, silence gives consent. It still does. Everyone understands that. People are afraid. I understand that. They're afraid of being persecuted. Do you think you're going to avoid persecution by being silent? There is no extent to the limits that the progressives won't go because they have to progress in order to fulfill their <coughs> worship of their God. They will go into as far as they can go. So if you do not push back, you will be eradicated. That's just what we're dealing with. So those that call us fascists are fascists. Now, suggestions in front of you here. I've got seven here. How can we respond? I have a series of Christian leaders here. I know there are some pastors, there are some teachers, there are principals, there are interested parents. Uh, first one I've got there, I'd actually like to put one before that, start a Christian school. Start one. 
We did this a year ago, uh, not out of response to this curriculum, uh, the sex ed curriculum, but because we had convictions about the very things Joe spoke about. That it was a calling for the church and there was something significant to it. That's the real reason to do it. You don't do it for negative reasons, you do it because we're called to do it. That's the reason you have to do it. You do it to honor Christ because it says in his word to do it. That has to be your primary motivation. On the other hand, you can see what the contrary is leading to now. So now it's indisputable. How can we not do this? It's easy to start a school if you've got a church. Uh, it's, uh, churches are historically allowed to start schools. If you have questions about that, we have gentlemen here that can speak to you about how to start a Christian school in your church right now. If you're not going to do it, if you have no church that's willing to do this, you can support your local Christian schools. When you do so, ask them about their curriculum and talk to them about some of the concerns in that curriculum. Do talk to them about it. Um, it's hard being an educator in our day. Teachers are, in general, very good people, despite the way um, we <coughs> see them, even in the Christian community. It's hard to be a teacher these days. People look at you through squinted eyes because you've been co-opted, and they feel like you're a sellout, even though they're equally sellouts, quite frankly. But you're looked at right through the corner of your eye. But to ask them about it and partner with them, get alongside them, get your church to financially support it even. Joe talked about the tithe. That, that's the one thing that is necessary often in these schools is financial support. If they had that, then they could drop the curriculum price and then there'd be greater access. Uh, secondly, organize information meetings about the curriculum in your local churches and community centers. I have had people speak to me, and I know Joe's received the same, who aren't even Christians telling me that they can't find a Christian that's willing to talk about this. It's a shame. I was at a rally yesterday and they were shouting out shame at the curriculum. And I was one of the few Christians there and I couldn't help thinking that they were shouting at the Christians shame as well because they were silent. It's shame. It's a disgrace. It's a scandal. So organize these. Offer them up. Uh, people will actually be attracted by the Christian faith. We need to have trust in what the Word of God tells us about the gospel. It's appealing to people. Believe me, there are people out there that want to hear the good news. They're coming. They're looking to you. They're saying, where is the church? Reach out to them. There are actually now uh, concerned parents groups surrounding this curriculum. Some of them are, are Christians. Many of them are not. They're first-generation Canadians. And they thought they were moving to a Christian country. They genuinely did. And they're shocked. Where are the Christians? Open your churches to them. You could offer a homeschooling consortia to them in this September. Just offer your space to it if the cost of education is an issue. That brings them into your doors. It shows that you care about their children. If this isn't evangelism, then I don't even know what you think evangelism is. Because we just heard about the little child being the model of the disciple and why the children will be, th that's the future. That's your evangelism field. We need church, not church planting movements, but school planting movements. That is the church and its mandate. So huge evangelism opportunity. If you're a pastor here, start up a school. At least <coughs> let people use the space. You're going to have to oversee it and so forth, but by all means. Uh, fourthly, speak to your local MPPs. Go in numbers. Don't go by one at a time because they'll talk to you and they'll placate you and they'll ignore you. If, if five of you go, they'll think you represent 50 because one complainant generally, they understand there are 10 others who have the same uh, feeling and they're not coming forward. It actually does have an effect on your MPPs. Um, fifthly, speak to your local school trustees. They actually have the capacity to resist this at that level, I believe. I could, be I could be corrected on this, but I believe if there are sufficient trustees on a local board, they can say, we're not bringing this in. Now, they'll have to have backbones, needless to say. But it's possible. Speak to them about your concerns. They're, they're elected officials as well. Um, sixthly, write informative letters or columns to your local paper, not the Globe and Mail, the National Post, the Toronto Star. They, do it in your local paper because they actually are always looking for material, firstly, and secondly, everyone actually reads them. 
It comes into your door. That's the most read paper, not the Toronto Star. It's your local rag. And you can write a protest little letter, I'm concerned about this. And then some, somebody said, oh, I'm not the only one. And it creates a sense, because one of the things, and this, I always remember this from my study of history, Adolf Eichmann, when he shipped uh, the uh, Jews off to Auschwitz and so forth, he looked around him, he thought there was a problem with it, but he looked to the aristocrats, they had an aristocracy in Germany, to his superiors, culturally, his social superiors, and he saw that none of them had a concern with it, and he said, if they don't have a concern with it, then why should I? So again, the people who aren't Christians, and that's 70% of the population in Canada, are looking, and they're not hearing Christians stand up for it, and they're thinking, well, if Christians don't stand up for it, then why should I? I thought that was their issue, but they're staying silent. Uh, finally, support this Hamilton father, who has decided to do it through the court. He's been trying to take his child out of the, or the Hamilton uh, district school board uh, for refusing to give him notice about uh, lessons that will contradict his religious beliefs. He's asked for notice. He's apparently entitled to it. There's a form for it. They have refused to do it for two years. It's now in the courts. It has been for two years. Uh, the school board has obviously got deep pockets. It's been joined recently by the Teachers Federation. Limitless pockets. Their aim is to break him, obviously financially. The process is part of the punishment. This man has decided to stick his neck out on it. I would urge people to stand behind him on this because if he wins the case, this is a significant victory. And his case is very strong. I mean, it's very strong. And they don't want the case to be decided on. That's <laughs> why you extend the process. He has been doing it for two years. Details are there. Um, let me conclude there. And uh, I'm sure we'll take questions in a little bit, but thank you very much.